Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our adult cycling class. Thank you for joining this afternoon. During this presentation, you will learn about safety tips and plenty more. We want this class to be interactive, so we encourage you to prepare your questions and post them on the Facebook comments. We have an incredible instructor, Mr. Paul Mikowicz from Bike Walk Montclair, who will be teaching us how to ride more confident as we gear up for the Shared Bike and Scooter Program, NORTGO. My name is Jennifer Fana, and I am the Administrative Assistant for the NORC People's Assembly. If you have not already done so, please register to be part of our email list by emailing your interest to NORCPeoplesAssembly at ci.norc.nj.us. I, along with Ms. Andrea Mason, will be your host. And now let's begin our class. Please welcome Mr. Paul Mikowicz. Hello, this is Paul, and there we go, start my video. So I am very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And we have a lot of information to share. And along the way, there may be some questions. So we'd like to take some pauses in between uh, the three logical sections of this presentation to address some questions. And we will be taking a look at those. If you could put questions in the chat, um, or share, that would be great. Again, my name is Paul Mikowitz, and I'm also representing the New Jersey Bike Walk Coalition, and I've been teaching bike education programs for a number of years. I'm a, a bike commuter. I'm a big believer in using my bicycle for transportation, so I'm not a racer. Um, I've done lots of, you know, vacation-type long rides, but I just use it for transportation and I like to support people in using their bicycle to get around safely. I ride in city roads, town roads around Montclair to Union, uh, lots of rides in Newark. And uh, there are a lot of great strategies that we're gonna talk about and I'll share today. And there's a lot of them that are counterintuitive. They just, we tend to do things that think we're gonna keep, uh, that are gonna keep us safe, but actually, put us more out of view and make us less relevant. So if there's three things you remember from today, remember to be visible. And that's not just wearing bright clothes and having lights, but where you position yourself to be visible, to be predictable. So being predictable, we want to obey traffic law, not because it's just a law, but it's because it's organized. And we'll talk about that. But so other people know what we're going to do. If we're all over the place, which a lot of us do, I've done it before myself. Um, after this training, I bet you will feel a greater level of responsibility to kind of play by the rules so every, everyone knows what you're doing. So we stop at stop signs. We stop at um, red lights. And bicycles don't have a uh, special uh, right to just blow through those, but I'm sure you see it all the time. We want cars, drivers, motorists to know what we're going to do so they can better take care of us. So be visible, be predictable. And a third one you might not think about, but is really, really important, particularly for us, and that is to be courteous. So we want to build a good relationship with motorists. Quite often, uh, I hear stories from people who ride bikes, and they tend to share the, the most uh, dramatic ones, you know, of bad interactions with motorists. And that leads to a perception. Um, but quite often, the anger that you may feel from a motorist is not the kind of anger that they're mad because we possibly might hurt them. It's they, they don't want to hurt us. And we startle them or they're a little bit scared um, because they didn't know what we were going to do. We did something unexpected. So it's important for us to be predictable. And it's important for us to be courteous by playing by the rules and um, cooperating with everyone else. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen here in a second, and we're gonna to go to uh, a presentation that is through Cycling Savvy. Cycling Savvy is an organization out of Orlando, Florida. Uh, it got started out of the Department of Transportation, and they put together some great graphics, a great training. Uh, my wife and I went down to Orlando, got certified through them, and they have really got this thing wired. So 
I'm going to just look at traffic law and rules of movement. So something that we have here, we want to be simple. So rules of movement, uh, the rules of the road got established a long time ago, and they're very simple. They're meant to be predictable and cooperative. So we take turns uh, and they were created before motor vehicles. So a, a quick history, this is what the roads look like. You know, people were, uh, the roads were used for a lot of different things and you don't see any cars there. Vehicles in 1900, this is what was in the streets. This was in the roads, bicycles. Bicycles came along and they were the problem because they were called scorchers, people racing around. And at some point, somebody said, and this man, William uh, Phelps Eno was hired to create rules that would allow everyone to get along. Um, now I have to say that when he made the rules of the road, there weren't that many cars on the road. So I wish they didn't use this picture in this presentation, but, um, and he never even got a license, but he, he created the rules of the road. So we'll go over that. Um, there is one little thing here. I want to show you this. Just take a look at this for a second. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, what the heck? Now, this is a scene in India. You see pedestrians. You see little rickshaws, you see buses, motorcycles, bicyclists. It seems like, and I'm not gonna play the whole thing here, but it seems like what is going on there? And it actually is working to a degree, it's cooperative, no priorities. People just are working things out as they go through. And it is a, it works because it's all at a slow speed. It's not a great system. We actually have a very good system and these are the rules of movement. So we're gonna go through this. Some of these things you, pr you probably don't even think about, you just take it for granted. Drive on the right. Now, this is a big one for people on bicycles because a lot of people believe that they should be on a bicycle, they should be riding against the traffic so they could see cars coming. And although that's common for joggers and walkers, joggers and walkers can move laterally and on a bike, you cannot move laterally. You can only change direction while moving forward. Also the closing speed when you're riding a bicycle on a uh, closing speed with a car oncoming car is a lot faster because you're traveling most likely much faster than you would be by walking. So we are actually obligated to follow the rules of the road and we have the same rights and duties and responsibilities as drivers of other motor vehicles. So we ride on the right, and this is meant to be predictable. Pass on the left. Again, I know we're in New Jersey. That doesn't always happen, but we're supposed to pass on the, on the left. So slower moving traffic moves off to the right. Another one is position for destination. Again, you might just do this sort of naturally driving a car. You come up to an intersection, you're gonna make a left-hand turn you're going to position yourself a little bit of left in the lane. Or if you're going right, you're going right in the lane. And if you're going straight, you stay right in the middle. And that is you're sort of tipping your hand of where you're going. You're also being courteous because you're letting other motor vehicles get around you. So if you're gonna make a left, you move a little left and it's easier for people to get around you. Priority, I had fun with this one earlier today. So first come, first serve. First come, first serve means whoever's in the lane first has the right of way. It's not predicated on speed. So you can see the little visual there. It's a car, it's a tractor, it's a horse and buggy. There is no rule that says the car in back, just because you can go faster that you need to get around or, or you need to get out of the way if you're on your bike. Now we'll talk about courtesy later on. And there are some impeding laws, but really, so many exceptions, um, they virtually never affect us. So first come, first serve, you're in the lane, you, you deserve to, to be there and stay there. Yield before changing lanes. All right, so now we're in our own lane and we're gonna go into someone else's lane. What we need to do is yield to them. 
quite often that is, you know, you're uh, as a cyclist, if you can imagine that cyclist with the yield sign, imagine that's a bicyclist. They suddenly have to go around a parked car. You have to look, look over your shoulder and see if someone's coming. You can't just go around and assume they're going to stop for you. Another rule of movement is yield before entering a roadway. Again, we might take this for granted. Uh, that person probably has a stop sign there. The other main arterial there has is faster moving traffic. So you also yield entering a faster moving roadway. Uh, it could be getting on a highway. You need to yield to the cars that are already on the highway and you get on your ramp and that's why you want some acceleration in your, in your vehicle. So we're yielding. Those are for priority. Now this is, again, priority when it comes to intersections and uh, how to get through intersections. This is where we tend to have most of our crashes because there's so much going on. Yield before crossing through traffic. So again, this person's changing lanes. The car that's coming straight through is not. So we have to yield to them and we're crossing over. So not only are we changing lanes, we're going to be cutting across someone else's lane. Making a left-hand turn as a cyclist is probably one of the scarier things a lot of people do. So we'll spend some time on strategies, how to do that, uh, how to do it better and alternatives. You don't always have to get out there and make a left-hand turn. You can just go straight across and then go straight again. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. So yield when changing, um, crossing over some lane, first come first serve at the intersection. Whoever gets there first has the right of way. This is assuming it's an equal unsignalized intersection, kind of a four-way stop or no, no signal at all. We don't have too many of those. All right, what happens when you have an exact tie? So assuming those cars get the intersection at the same time, just remember it this way. The person on the right has the right. Person on the right has the right of way. So as they pull up, one car is on the right, one car is on the left, and it's the car that is on the right that gets to go first. So those are some simple rules of movement that we want to remember and very important um, that we practice those. Okay. Now it comes to bicycle law. Some of this I'm going to cover more specifically. New Jersey doesn't, well, it's coming up. Uh, New Jersey doesn't have any like bike lane laws where you have to use the bike lane. Some states have very specific uh, rules about those kinds of things. But let me just start here. Bicyclists or drivers. If you operate, assuming you, you drive a vehicle, if you operate your bike and drive your bike the same way you drive your car, following the rules, stopping at stop signs, red lights, yielding, all those rules of movement, that is... Uh, going to make you much safer. Position yourself doing the same thing. You have the same rights and duties as drivers of other motor vehicles. And there are a few exceptions, certain regulations and provisions, uh, which can have no application. So in our case, we really don't have much that we're dealing with at all. Very quickly, when it comes to equipment, yes, want a fixed seat. You can't be standing on pegs and sitting on handlebars. Uh, we need brakes, night operation, a white front light, red rear reflector, red rear light. Now, some of those things might seem fairly obvious, but there's a lot of people out there riding that I just shake my head because I can barely see them. And if people can't see you, how are they supposed to keep you safe and stay out of your way? So it's important to have those basic things. And what it doesn't say is wear some bright clothes. Really wear some bright clothes. Makes a big difference. There's a lot of lights that uh, people's eyeballs are searching through. A lot of different lights. If you have some bright clothing, now you start to look more than just like a little flashing light. Signaling turns. Yes, we got the signal turns like other motors, motorists. Sidewalk riding. Okay, this is a big category here. When we're on the sidewalk, now we have the rights and duties of pedestrians. And it's important that we uh, yield to pedestrians. And again, the rules op, uh, change a little bit. So if we were looking at this intersection here in this roadway, 
let's count all the crosswalks. We see this one real obviously, right? There's a crosswalk. Here's a crosswalk. This one striped doesn't have the same kind of painting. That's a crosswalk. Here's a crosswalk. And here is a crosswalk. So even though there isn't any painted crosswalk, the law says there is an implied crosswalk because you have the end of the land there and the corner, you have to go somewhere. So that implies a crosswalk. And even though there's no sidewalk, and unfortunately, some of our communities, we don't even have sidewalks. So again, you have an implied crosswalk there. Now, when it comes to getting across those crosswalks, whoops, let me go over here. When there is a pedestrian signal and we're on our bike, we have to obey this. If we're in the crosswalk, we have to act like a pedestrian and we have to follow that rule. So if there is a pedestrian light, we need to go with that light. Believe it or not, when it's got the little hand up as pedestrians, we should not be walking then. And why? Well, because there's certain timing of these traffic signals that are allowing other vehicles to possibly turn. And they don't want us to be out in the roadway when other turning traffic is, is coming through. So we have to wait for that little green person there. And then we walk across. If there is no pedestrian specific traffic signal, we use the main traffic light and we have to go with the green light. We don't want to cross traffic when it's the other uh, roadway has the right of way. So we have to wait there. And then in cases where it's just a stop sign and not a signal, and we aren't on the primary roadway, so that person just crossed over going in the primary direction. And again, uh, this is where it gets tricky. Pedestrians, pedestrians have the right of way. It doesn't mean you're going to get it but you do have the right of way. And so you have to verify. So you see that person walk across and cars need to stop. Now notice they stop at the corner, stick their toe in the, in the lane and that activates and lets drivers know that you are intending to cross and they need to stop. Again, of course, you want to make sure they're stopping, helps make eye contact with them and verify it's always nice to give them a wave thank you um and make that connection so it's important that we are um playing by those rules in a sense again if you're on a bike and you're just cruising through you are uh you need to obey those same kind of rules and be aware that you might be faster i would recommend you get off your bike and you walk it if you're going through an intersection like that, if you're going to be in the crosswalk. So here's another crosswalk. Step into the crosswalk to activate it. That lets people know you're not just standing there checking your phone, waiting for an Uber. And then when there's mid blocks, this is where it gets tricky. Mid block crossings are actually illegal. And, but it happens. We know we see it happen all the time. Uh, in between signalized intersections. So it's actually prohibited there. And it's not prohibited when you have another intersection in between signalized. Getting a little bit technical here, just a little bit off track here, but I just want to quickly go through it. And then yielding to street traffic. The main thing is you need to yield to all those motorists out there before you cross. And one of the more dangerous areas for pedestrians, kids, anybody on the sidewalk are driveways. So I'd gotten, um, gotten a tweet about, well, well, we'll get into right crosses later on, but anytime there is a driveway, again, this is a pedestrian, we're not moving as fast, we can adjust faster, but we wanna look and look around to see who's coming behind us. So that car with the yield sign coming behind that walker, well, all three cars have yield signs. We have to be looking around to anticipate who is going to be crossing this uh, sidewalk because you have lots of um, interaction there. All right, moving back. So that's our general operation roadway position. This is a big one. So now we're back in the road and most of us have learned to 
stay on the right side of the road and kind of stay out of the way. And that is generally true in terms of staying on the right side when slower than other traffic, a bicyclist must ride as close as practicable to the right curb or edge of the roadway. However, there are exceptions. And practicable, what does that mean? Capable of being done within the means and circumstances present at the time. So there are a lot of different circumstances. The fluid, it's a very fluid situation. The conditions of the lane, uh, what's happening with other vehicles, speeds, all kinds of things. Uh, so who's, who decides what's practical? Well, it's not the motorist, uh, it's the cyclist. You're the one who is in that situation. And that is a huge exception to being far to the right on the road. So a lot of what we'll be talking about is lane position, being in the lane, controlling the lane, and why that makes the most sense, even though it might seem a little bit scary to you in the very beginning. So what are some of these exceptions when it's not practicable or not safe? Passing slower traffic, of course, you're going to go around. This happens a lot. Um, we we're talking about this in some of the other classes where if you're tra traveling on Bloomfield Avenue and you have four lanes of traffic, two in each direction, the right lane is quite often clogged with people delivering things, double parking, um, the, the buses go there. So a lot of motorists are not going to want to get stuck in that right-hand traffic. So that actually makes it a little bit more attractive for a cyclist because we can squeeze through there. We don't take up nearly as much space as a motorist. So that's actually not such a bad thing for us, but we may need to pass around slower vehicles, avoid hazards. I mentioned if there's glass and potholes and, and uh, puddles and all kinds of things, that's another reason why we don't have to stay to the far right and we might need to be farther out into the lane. Preparing for a left-hand turn. We don't wanna make a left coming from the far right lane. And the biggie is, when you're in a lane too narrow to share. So let's look at that. This is the general operating assumption or operating space for a cyclist, four feet. This is from engineering traffic design and guidelines. Four feet is what is considered um, a minimum and a three foot passing zone, which is whether it's law or not, that just what the, is considered a reasonable minimum uh, space. And gladly, I will say that there is a bill that has taken two big steps forward. It's called the Safe Passing Bill in New Jersey. And New Jersey is one of the few states in the area that does not have a Safe Passing Bill. And it's about to take one more step. And I think it's going to be voted into law, uh, which is not just safe passing of cyclists, but safe passing for people on scooters, in wheelchairs, on foot. So it has a lot of great detail to it, and that's uh, another story for another day. But as far as our operating space, we need a little bit of space to wiggle room, wobble room on our bike, and safe passing. Now, if we're in a roadway, most typical roadways are 10 or 12 feet um, as they're painted. And even in a 12-foot lane with a mini, you can see that that operating space is overlapping with the safe passing area. And that's an, a, a mini. If you go to a larger lane and a larger vehicle, you still have that same overlap because it's a larger vehicle. So if you get into larger, even larger vehicles, we see a lot of these trucks, much less a semi in a 14 foot lane. Uh, that is really too close and too narrow to be sharing with another vehicle. So what do you do? Well, we will um, get into that in a little bit. Slow vehicle law. So we're kind of painting the foundation here of all the laws and rules and restrictions. Must use the right lane, except when you're passing. I mentioned that, two-lane road, pullouts. There aren't any uh, two-lane road pullout laws in New Jersey. So uh, we don't have, some states have some kind of funky, funky laws. Um, but we don't have anything that we have to worry about. And lane widths, I did that. Vehicle, there we go, facility laws. We don't have this either. So I can kind of move on. That is section one. 
you can see down here, I have rules, safety, and success. Uh, groups is another training actually. So we're gonna be doing safety and success next. If I'm gonna just take it off, well, no, I'll leave it on screen share and uh, ask if Andrea or Jen, if there are any questions or anything that you would like to address that you've heard from folks. How are we doing time-wise here? All right, yep. we're doing pretty good. So luckily, um, and thank you for the first part of this, the presentation, the, we've gotten only one question from an attendee, and that is, like with motor vehicles, is, bike, is there an insurance for bike riders? Oh, good question. Um, I'm not familiar, but I wouldn't be surprised because there are some bikes that are getting very, very expensive. Um, and, but I'll just keep it real simple. I don't know. I just don't know. Um, you know, motorcycles, uh, scooters. Yes, we have insurance for our scooter. Um, certainly, uh, probably required um, for motorcycles, but I don't know about bicycles. So what I'm thinking is if it has a motor, then most likely the insurance is required. But I, I think as a new cyclist, I'll call my insurance company to see if my bicycle and those things that I do while riding are covered by my car insurance. Well, I know AAA will pick you up. AAA will cover a bike. You may or may not have known that. They mm -hmm. did. They, they came out with that a while ago. Um, and uh, so, yes, if you if that's a concern, oh, my gosh, what if, if I get a flat? Call AAA, they'll pick you up. All right. So shall we move on? Yes, please. OK. Safety. All right. So I mentioned the perception of safety. Um, there's a lot of scary stories. And, and some of us cyclists, we love to tell all the crazy, exceptional stories. But honestly, I do a lot of bike commuting. I've been bike commuting um, for 10 years to this one location. And it's very, very rare I have ever, ever have any kind of negative interaction. Um, and it's usually pretty, pretty, you know, straightforward. Now, there's a perception there. When I tell people I ride, they go, oh, you're crazy. It's like, no. Um, there are, we, we hear this in the news. Things get um, kind of glamorized in the news. And we hear of uh, other common bicyclist behavior, you know, of, you know, bad actors out there doing, doing things. I hear that from other, other people, motorists, uh, when they know and they want to vent about cyclists doing things. I usually hear about it, but we hear a lot of bad stories, but there's actually a lot of good going on out there. So the perception is um, not necessarily what it is in reality. So what are some of the advantages that we have as cyclists? Well, uh, we're far exposed, right? So uh, that's not an advantage that we're exposed, but in a sense, how can it be an advantage? We're slow. Quite often people think of that as being a disadvantage, but if we're slow, we can respond and react to things much easier. So although I have ridden a motorcycle, I have a motorcycle license, I feel a lot safer on my bicycle. Um, and frankly, uh, to extend that, then the, if I had to say what were the, I have two close calls, two close calls that I've had um, in the last five years that like really kind of got my stomach to knot up and I was driving my car and someone just cut across in the parkway. They said, Oh, I got to get to that exit. And they cut right across. Wasn't expecting that at all. So where I've had two instances that made me really scared, I've been driving a vehicle, not riding my bike. Um, when we are riding a bike, what are some of these advantages that we have? We can see, we don't have any blind spots. We can see everything all around us. We look around, uh, we can hear. Um, you have much greater awareness. I think I'm far more engaged when I'm riding my bike than when I drive. Um, you know, when I drive, man, I remember eating a meal. You know, people we do all kinds, we're multitasking, do all these things. Not 
not what we necessarily want to be doing or should be doing, but we get to multitasking and we may not be as uh, present. And of course, there's a big concern about distracted driving. So we're exposed, we can see, we're engaged, uh, we're working at speeds where we can react. Um, generally, I can stop my bike faster than the car can stop their, you know, their car, their vehicle. And uh, so that's the reaction time. We could be more nimble and maneuverable. We can, we're small. We can get in and out of little spaces. Uh, we can get out of the way pretty fast. So there's a lot of advantages there. Okay, here's the fun part. So this is uh, common crash types. If you take all bicycle crashes and the most common are represented by those different colors. So you see a big check section of blue, red, green, purple, a gray area, a smaller area. I don't know what those colors are, orange, um, brown, and they all represent common crashes, crash types. And what I'm going to do is show you what they stand for. Unless Andrea, you're going to stop me if we're trying to get uh, yes. responses. All right, I'll stop. Sure. So what I did is in the Facebook feed, I did write a post saying it's interaction time. So okay. we have a few people on. So I know we're curious in knowing what specifically they think is the most common crash type for that blue area. Meaning, what's the reason why the most crashes occur? So that's a little less than half of that whole pie is the, the most common cause for motor, motors, uh, bicycle crashes. All right. So I have a comment, but nobody um, yet to say what, what they think the bike. Okay. So, okay, let's move on. Okay. So this is what it is, folks. Solos. Solo falls, people just, they slip, they lose control of their bike, whatever, they run into something. Uh, we could, we'll talk about that in a moment, but solo falls, nobody else's fault but our own. And then if you look at the other two big sections, you have another bicyclist and you have moving motor vehicles as opposed to parked motor vehicles. So a parked motor vehicle crash, that belongs up here in the solo section because you ran into it and it wasn't moving. Um, so for the most part, you have virtually the same uh, chance of being hit by another cyclist as you do being hit by a motor vehicle. And then you have the purple, which is animals. That I have to say, I don't think I've ever been hit by an animal. Close, close, almost got hit by a deer. And then pedestrians, very small, but very prominent. And we'll talk about that when we talk about courtesy. So those are all the most common causes. Now, if you look at just this 18%, this red piece of pie here, we're going to take all bicycle crashes and just take that 18% because that's the motor vehicles part. And probably that's the part we're most scared about, right? Well, we might be scared about solo falls too. Let's look at falls. So as I mentioned, most crashes are... Um, our own fault. So there's railroad tracks. I'm not sure what happened there. It looks like there's kind of a pole on the sidewalk. Uh, railroad tracks are really bad. You see the skinny tires. It's very easy to have your tire slip down into a groove. And what's similar, uh, well, I'll show you some other cracks in a, in a little bit, but sand or gravel might be hard to see. You don't have good traction and your wheel can slip. So it's uh, very easy to lose your control there. And again, that's a, a, a matter of speed. Potholes, oh my gosh, we got a lot of potholes everywhere. And you have to be very, very careful. Parallel cracks. So this looks a lot more dramatic, right? And yes, you could definitely lose control of your bike, dropping your wheel into that. But these may be not as observable, not as obvious, but can be just as dangerous, if not more so, because you can lose control by losing your balance. You just suddenly start uh, your, your tire. You can't turn your tire anymore and you can't correct. Same thing here where you have a 
a uh, higher road surface and it drops down into the shoulder and there's a uneven, uh, well, they call it a gutter seam. Certainly drain, uh, great drains, they've changed these. You don't see these too many too often now, but um, you can really lose the control of your bike there. Bollards are very easily obscured when you're riding along. And if you have, you're in a group and a couple of people are ahead of you and they ride by, you don't see that bollard. You, you know, one, someone standing in front of it would, could um, very easily obscure it from view. And then they suddenly move and you're riding along like, oh my gosh, there it is. So, and then guy wires, um, again, might be harder to see. At least they put that protective yellow uh, plastic covering on there, but still a problem. Okay, so what do we do about, going to go back here to this 18%, reducing the risk. All right, so now we're talking about just the 18%. So we have a new pie chart. This only is addressing the 18%. You can see law violations and facing traffic. So let's look at law violations. I mentioned we need to, uh, we had the same rights and duties as drivers of other motor vehicles. So if we just avoid illegal behavior, ride with traffic, obey traffic control devices, respect the right of way, uh, ride sober, we really take a lot out, 33% we just removed. And if we drive on the road, again, we're, this kind of relates a little bit to the um, law violations. So we want to stay right on the right side of the road, understand the limitations of bicycling and pedestrian space. And again, we'll talk more about that later on. But if we just stay off the sidewalks, stay in the road, um, act like a driver of a motor vehicle facing traffic, we remove 45%. And I'm going to show you a little video in a moment uh, of why it's really dangerous when you're out there on the sidewalk, all the things that are happening. So now we have this other area we call edge behavior. So if we constantly ride on the far, far right, we become um, irrelevant. People don't see us. And so if we ride defensively, so we have strategies about being defensive driving, we want to be relevant, we want to protect our space, and we want to achieve vantage and visibility. If anyone drives a motorcycle and ever took a motorcycle safety course, it's the same concept. You have to position yourself so you can see and you're not obscured by lines of sight. So we take that out and that's us using strategies, making better decisions. So obey the law, ride or drive your bike like you drive a car and strategies for edge behavior. And that leaves that little tiny gray area and that was of that smaller 18%. So there's a lot there. Uh, we just reduced a lot of problems and reduced our risk quite a bit. All right. High risk areas, reducing risk, safe legal lefts. So this is some of the things that we do here. Here are illegal lefts. And in one of our sessions, someone was kind of laughing because like, oh, yeah, I do that. So we're in a bike lane. Oh, I got to make a left-hand turn. Oh, it looks like it's open. No cars coming. And I'm in a bike lane. Oops. So that car is not expecting a cyclist to come from their right. They're looking to the left to see if it's safe for them to pull out and get into the lane. Here's another one where we are maybe in the bike lane or just on the shoulder edge behavior. And now we're going to make this big bending turn. Not a good way to go. Let me get back there. And making a lateral move. This is how we do it. You look. You signal. You look again. You verify. Yep, see that car slow down. And then you give them a little wave. And that's that courtesy. Acknowledge them. Even if they might, you think they might be mad at you. Thank you. Thank you for slowing down and giving me a little bit of space. It really makes a big difference. Got to keep going back here, sorry. And then if we're making a left-hand turn 
and you're in a narrow lane. So assume this lane is too narrow to share. You don't want someone suddenly deciding they're going to make a pass when you want to make a left-hand turn. So you are, uh, remember the rules of movement, you're indicating your destination by your lane position. So that person moved a little bit to the left. They signaled, they looked, signaled, and moved left. So they indicated to that car, like, don't pass me on the left. I'm going left. And that's what you would do if you're driving a car. Turn lane. So we do this on our on the bike portion where it can be very empowering to a cyclist when they have actually done that. We're used to riding our bike on the right side of the road, but in driving a vehicle, there are left only lanes. What do you do on a bike? You do the same thing. And when you do it and everything works just fine, you might be amazed. It's like that feels really, really good. It feels really empowering. Uh, even though in the beginning, you might feel a little weird having cars passing you on your right. They're not so much passing you as just moving into the other lane. So we do that and we do that on our on the bike section and you realize, oh yeah, that's what I would do if I was driving a car. Now, if you're in a bike lane, we don't wanna make that big swooping turn. So you gotta get over there. So there are a lot of circumstances where it makes sense for you to get out of that bike lane and making a left-hand turn is one of them. Okay, so that was a big chunk there of, um, not doing illegal behavior and um, obeying traffic law. Sidewalk crashes. So this is the other section here. So this represents how far you travel going at different speeds. So we have a pedestrian walking at three miles per hour, and then we have a cyclist. I think we have three cyclists. Okay, no scooter. We have three cyclists at 10, 15, and 20 miles an hour. And that's how far they go in one second. Now look how far away this person who's riding a bike is from that drive out. And if there's a, a motor vehicle coming along the roadway and they're gonna turn into that driveway or that side street, they may see the pedestrian, but they're very likely not going to be as aware of those people on bikes because they're traveling so fast. And that's only one second, 1,001. Typically, Reaction time is two and a half seconds. So now we have to back them up even farther. Look, the 20 mile an hour rider is not even on the page. So now let's see what it looks like with cars coming through here, trucks. So this is what happens. You have a motor vehicle, want to make a turn. You have a cyclist rolling along up. These are all different circumstances. Again, they're not looking way down the sidewalk, most likely. You might say, oh, I do, I do, uh, and that's good. But very possibly what they're looking to do is they're looking for anyone immediately in that crosswalk and that car coming around, uh, they're gonna be able to swing around and, and make that turn without bumping the car. And it's also that car that's driving out. So these are all circumstances, and that's assuming there's fairly open visibility. How about we put this in the mix? We add some obstruction, visual obstruction, and now you're riding behind bushes or parked cars, other things. It can be really, really bad. So you get the idea there. Oh, I want to go back to that. I missed. Sorry. Got to put it back out there. Two and a half seconds. Put these guys back up there. So up here, number two. Number two, where do you think they're looking? The sidewalk? Nope. They're looking at that truck. Do I have space? They're looking at all that traffic coming down the road and they're looking to see if they have space to quick make that left-hand turn. And believe it or not, this is where most pedestrians get hit. They're in the crosswalk and they have the right of way, but it's the turning vehicles that are in a much more complicated situation. They have blind spots in their vehicle and they just don't see you. So. They're looking, is it my space? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, waiting. Up, oh, I got my spot up. And there goes the cyclist because they are way off uh, out of view. So we have to make ourselves much more prominent. Get the idea there. This is another one. And 
this is again where people get nervous. We ride far on the right and want to try to stay out of the way. But when we're riding far on the right like this, we're virtually inviting cars to pass us by. So the little mini gets by okay. Maybe another car a little bit bigger, but the truck with the trailer, not good. And we don't have eyes in the back of the head. Again, the rules of the road, um, first come, first serve. We do not, we're not obligated to just move over for a slower vehicle. I'm sorry, a faster vehicle behind us. And we are far more likely to get sideswiped than hit from behind. That virtually never happens. That's what we're afraid of, is being hit from behind. So what do we do? We correct by getting farther out there. So now the vehicle can see from a distance that they have to get out and get around you, not to squeeze through that lane. Dooring is another obstacle and crash cause. And we just we should just never ride in the door zone. This is what happens. And you either hit the door or you hit the door and then you crash out into the lane. And now you're subject to being hit by another motor vehicle or you swerve unexpectedly and that truck wasn't expecting you. So that's not being predictable if you have to suddenly swerve out there. So we have the strike zone, the startle zone, the buzz zone, an effective lane. Let's look at the strike zone. Well, we just did the strike zone. We don't want to be in that red bar. We also want to give ourselves a little bit of margin so we're not startled if we are, if someone does open up the door. And now we're not really committed in that lane. So the buzz zone kind of shows you that we're not out there in the lane enough. So it's not, um, that lane, there's not enough space to share. So this is what we want to do. We want to get all the way out there in that big green area. This is where we're safe. Now, after these four cars, there's a spot where I ride. Uh, and there's a few parking spaces that are always out in front of these apartments. And there's no cars before them and there's no cars after them. I have to get out there and take the lane. And then after that, I just move right inside. It takes seconds for me to pass by those parked cars. I put my hand out. I control the lane. Everyone's fine. And I just pull down. And not only that, down the road, there's a traffic light. And I quite often will see those same cars that pass me. After I've controlled the lane, I pull in. They go by me. They're sitting at the traffic light. So it is a, um, a situation that we can control ourselves by defensive driving, controlling the lane. All right, so this is what Brendan was asking me about earlier today, about the right hook. How do you defense this? Now, in this case, it's an intersection. And anytime, it's, whether it's an intersection or a driveway, it could be a driveway into a shopping plaza. Anytime you're riding the bike and you're trying to share the lane, assuming this is a shareable lane, it's only a mini. If you come up to an intersection, get out there, control the lane so no one's going to right hook you. Now, if you have, you know, endless row of um, entrances, uh, that's going to be hard. And I, again, I have a little video I'll show you in a moment. So the shoulder, far right, bike lane, it's kind of the same. You're sort of out of view. And I've, I've talked to people that have had, I, well, one person who had a crash. And he was riding really fast and maybe was invisible, not sure. Uh, but the motorist passed him and then right hooked him just like this. Because as soon as they pass you, now you're kind of history. And they're not thinking about you anymore. And meanwhile, you're still cruising along at maybe 20 miles an hour. Same idea. Crash. What do you do if you're in a bike lane? You get out of the bike lane to get through the intersection and avoid 
those circumstances. So when you are riding in traffic and everything is really slow, if not stopped, rather than being on the right side of the road and letting a car creep up on you, get out there, control the lane after the light goes. Then if you, if you have a shareable lane, you can get over to the side. Again, well, you want to avoid passing vehicles on the right. Very, very tempting. Very, very tempting because traffic congestion can be so slow. And you're thinking, I'm on a bike. Why do I got to wait for all these cars? Well, this is the, this is the risk that you run is that someone is going to right hook you. So if there were no turns, that wouldn't be so bad. But if you're coming up to an intersection, you better be aware any one of those vehicles can turn. So what do you do? You take your turn. You go through the intersection and then you get back into the bike lane. Same idea, coming cars coming at you. So again, it's kind of tight. I'm not real visible and people aren't looking at me as much as that red car is looking at that white truck. Do they have space? If you're riding a motorcycle, you do the same thing. You get out there where they can see you. You control the lane and you're much more visible. And then again, in that lane, it's really not a shareable lane. Here it is. It's shareable. But watch again and notice the shadow, which represents the blind spot. So as that red car comes up, there's a time lag there before they see you. You're kind of hidden behind that white truck. They don't see you. What do you do? Get out there, become more relevant, ride big so they can see you through the intersection, and then you can get back in again. Same thing. You don't want to be passing. You have to be very, very careful. You were just screened out. So that car that's making a turn. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, how much time are we saving and how much risk are we creating here? That's where the motorist might be really angry. Oh my gosh, they stop short and they're mad because they're scared. They almost hit you. They don't want to do that. All right. Last one here, the drive outs. So if you're on the far right, and again, see the shadow, how you're not as visible as that white truck starts to pull out, they're looking for spots. They're looking, do I have space to get out into that lane? I have to yield, that white truck has to yield to those other motor vehicles. They need to yield to you too, but they don't see you. So you get out there where you're more visible and you become visible farther from the intersection as you're giving that truck a better chance to see you. It's the same thing, whether you're in a bike lane, this was a narrow lane, uh, but you're sharing, or same idea, get out there, get out of the bike lane, become more visible, and then move back in again. And mention passing on the right. High risk areas. So this is what I want to show you. Just watch this for a few seconds. So this is a bike lane and it's a bike lane in the door zone. So that's a parked truck. Let's see what, let's see what happens. Just look at all the vehicles crossing over that bike lane all the conflicts. And you might also notice how fast the cars are going. And you got a lot of traffic lights down there. So it's not like they're going 40 miles an hour. That's maybe 15, that last car, maybe, maybe 20 miles an hour, maybe. So all of that congestion, all that interaction makes for riding in the edge of that bike lane pretty tricky. Um, those are the edge conflicts that we want to be very, very careful of.
So the effective lane, when you have a parked car, it's not 22 feet. Now we got 15 feet. And then you have the door zone, right? You have the door zone. So what do you do? You have the strike zone, the startle zone, and the buzz zone. So this is what we want to, want to position ourselves. And how do you know where to go? Well, cars don't want to be in the door zone. They don't want to drive right next to the parked cars. So this is really the effective lane for us. You stay out of that red area, out of the startle zone. We ride far enough to the left. Because if you're going to be farther to the right, not only are you going to be in the door zone, you're going to be tempting motorists to squeeze past you. And believe it or not, with all my commuting with multi-lane roads, it's actually easier to control the lane because there are other lanes for the motorists to move into. And they, when you are riding and make yourself very prominent here, they see you at a distance they see they need to change lanes and they move. Whoop. Oh, well, I don't know what happened. Somehow I <laughs> triggered my Siri. Anyway, those are, uh, that's the effective lane. Never feel, don't let, as they say, paint think for you. You don't want to ride in a bike zone. Uh, I'm sorry, in a door zone in a bike lane. Now we rode in a bike lane that was in the door zone, but you know where we rode? We rode right there. It, was, it seemed like it was a little bit wider and we rode on this left side. And that seemed like there was enough space for us to be outside the door zone and enough space for the motorist to pass us by. But it wasn't ideal because it didn't give us a lot of wiggle room, but it felt okay. And it was also very slow. We were on Ferry Street, and it was very slow. When you're dealing with this, this is again, one of the uh, challenges here. What we don't want to do is get into the blind spots of trucks. You have a lot of trucks in Newark um, and you do not want to uh, get into their blind spot and try to sneak past them because they might, you have to notice what, how trucks move and they have to move a little bit left before they move right. So you want to stay outside of here and you can see where they have to go. So very, very dangerous. And the same thing, if you're looking at pedestrians, so you want to give them lots of room. And if you look at the cyclists here, where it says left cross, they're in the bike lane. And you look at the savvy cyclists way up here, they can see, they can see that car coming. So you have a nice line of sight now. So you're not hidden behind the truck. You're not gonna get right hooked by the truck and you're not gonna get left crossed by that car. So that is putting yourself out there and no one, no one's gonna pass that, no motor vehicle is gonna pass that truck. They're not gonna squeeze by. So it's no problem for you to be riding that kind of left bumper of that truck to see oncoming cars. And then again, you can move back into the bike lane if you like, but you don't want to be right of that truck. All right. Very quickly, this is uh, a sun, a very bright sun that you're riding into. So if it's looking that way to you, you know, motorists coming behind you are not going to see you. Can anyone see the cyclist? coming at you. There's the cyclist. And you know what it looks like coming from behind that cyclist? This is what it looks like. Same picture, same situation, I should say, reversed. So sun ahead, sun behind. So you have to anticipate if you're that bicyclist, that car is coming towards you. It's harder to tell. If you're, if you're, if you're struggling to see, you can, it's easier, I think, to understand that cars coming behind you are struggling to see. If you can see just fine and you have long shadows, you should anticipate that motor vehicles, uh, motorists coming towards you might not be able to see you because they're glaring, they're looking into a very bright sun. So you have to actually be even more prominent. You really have to get out there. And then spotting the hazards. Okay, 
So if you look at all this stuff going on, you have edge behavior, the rider in red, and you have the rider in green. You have all these trucks and cars. You got these cars making a turn here. You got lights. What happens here? All right, so this is what happens to the rider. And these are all the concerns for that rot edge rider. They have these cars coming out, getting right hooked, getting doored, left turns, right hooks or left hooks. And then all this stuff down here as well. So we have another rider down here. How about driver behavior? So now we're gonna look at, it's not like they don't have any obstacles, but they have fewer because now they have a line of sight with these other vehicles. So it's a much better position. And again, generally, all of this is moving a lot more slowly. So those are, that's section two, safety. The next section is how to be successful. So Andrea, I'm gonna go back to you. Is there any, any questions, comments, concerns we wanna address? Quick time check here, so we're doing pretty good. So it's broken down just about evenly, Brendan. So Paul, I will take this opportunity to just go over a couple comments, um, if you will allow. Yes, please. Okay, so can you speak a little more? I know we passed this section a little while ago, but can you speak a little more about motor vehicles passing when there's a double solid line? Okay, great, yes. So when there is a double-sided line, although that double-sided line means it's unsafe to pass, it is also recognized that if a motor vehicle has the room to pass, meaning no one else is coming, then, I mean, it's, uns it's, it's double lined because it's a narrow space and there's not a whole lot of visibility, but what makes it okay for motorists to pass a cyclist and cross over a double yellow line is that one, you're probably going slower than the other motorists. So they're gonna pass you much quicker. And so it's, it's more likely that there is an opportunity for them to pass you. And we'll see some videos of this coming up. Um, bottom line is we've heard from law enforcement, you know, um, Andy Anderson has been involved in some of these. And he says, traffic, you know, uh, law enforcement is not gonna cite a motorist for making a crossing over that double yellow line if they make a safe pass around a cyclist. Like you're very oh, narrow, they, they don't need to go way out there. So they will, that's not a problem for a motorist. However, it's gotta be a safe pass, meaning you can't have, they should not be moving into the other lane, the oncoming lane when cars are coming. That's not a safe pass. So you can uh, also work with them. So we'll talk about being courteous and communicating in this next section, but that's, um, if, if, if that's the context of the question, you know, it's like uh, from a motorist standpoint, it's okay to pass uh, a cyclist so long as there's room, there's nobody coming. Yes, that exact that was exactly uh, what it was about. And then there's another comment about, well, actually, there were several comments about just safety in general. So there's so many nervous residents um, who are afraid to either get on the bike or ride alone. So they're afraid of the road because of either the demeanor of the drivers. And also one person even commented that well, as a business owner, it's inconvenient for the bike lane to be there because it impedes on deliveries. Yes. Well, I'm not going to um, really address the, the bike lane delivery and, you know, do we have bike lanes or not? That's a different issue. Um, and I do hear that. Uh, but when it, when it comes to, from a safety standpoint and feeling uncomfortable without a doubt doing these things, um, trying some of these, and, and now we're getting to the success point. So I sort of showed you all the scary stuff. Now we're just about to get to the section that is how to get around most of this. Uh, we've seen some, some strategies. But uh, in the beginning, you try these things. I, I suggest people don't do the scariest thing first. Try to stretch your, your uh, horizons and, and stretch your skills with just a little bit. 
So you go out riding when it's really quiet out, not a lot of vehicles. You make sure you're really bright. And when in doubt, you can always just move over, get out of the road, let people pass. You can walk across intersections. There's a lot of things that you can do to take the very conservative, maybe slower path in a sense. And that's quite all right. And then as you become more comfortable, you start trying some of these things. You realize, oh, yeah, everyone was fine. I, I got out there, I controlled the lane and no one was behind me honking. They just changed lanes and passed me. It's no big deal. Everyone was happy. So when it comes to you know, being success in the real, you know, success in the real world, we need to be mindful. I mentioned we're just naturally much more engaged when we're on our bike. We need to be observant. Yeah, that's why we're so engaged. We're looking at things all the time. I'm constantly scanning the roadway, um, looking for what's happening, who might possibly turn into this, you know, I'm passing a uh, shopping plaza maybe. And I have to be thinking, is there anyone coming up approaching me that's going to right hook me? I'm going to look back there and see. Um, so you need to be observant and identify patterns. So we'll talk about what lane to be in. Um, you don't want to be, normally we, we say, stay in the right furthest lane, you know, the farthest lane to the right that serves your direction. But if you're in a lane, the farthest to the right, and a lot of those cars, virtually everybody is peeling off to take an exit. Maybe that's not the lane to be in. And you actually take the next lane in, the second lane from right, and you're riding along and all these cars pass you on the right and they go right and they go on the entrance ramp or they're, they're leaving wherever they're going, that right is going or into a store and you just keep going. So you're actually um, cooperating with them and you're less in the way and less of a hindrance to anybody. Anyway, so that's identifying patterns, being strategic. So we'll talk about, you know, other ways to get around. And part of that is identifying those patterns. And when you have, say, platoons of, of uh, um, cars based on the lights and you start to learn the patterns of those traffic lights and you say, oh, you know what? If I come up here and I put the push the pedestrian signal, I can now turn right. And all those cars, all that volume is sitting there at a red light and I'm just cruising along and I might have 30 seconds, 45 seconds of the roadway to myself or pretty much to myself as opposed to all that ball behind, behind me. So um, we want to employ these things and I kind of jumped into it. Andrea, were there any other comments or questions? You, you can move ahead. It was, okay. yeah, that's fine. All right, so night weather, People say, what do you do at night? Well, a lot of lights. Very important to have lots of lights. And you want the lights pointed straight back. Take home on that one is just use the lights that are pointed straight back. Um, here's a few lights. So there's a lot of lights, right? It's kind of busy. Uh, so it's important that we are um, aiming our lights effectively. And let's look at a few photos here. Photo one. Oh, come on. What's going on? There we go. So you have a car and this picture is taken from behind the motorist, but we call them salmon riders. So this person is riding in the wrong direction. And believe it or not, as a cyclist, that could be a problem for you if you're doing the right thing. Um, in this kind of a road, I don't think I'd want to be on the edge anyway. And then it looks like there's snow going on as well. And then in rain, here's some photos. We got to be more prominent. You want to be very careful not to be going through puddles, not because you're going to get wet, but you don't know what's in the puddle aside from being slippery. It might be a pothole. These thick thermoplastic paint in crosswalks and signage are very slippery. So just like any other vehicle, you need to slow down when you're making a turn and you need to be aware of the surfaces that you're on. Again, these potholes can be under underneath a uh, in a puddle and that can be problematic for you so night rain snow and ice believe it or not um, you could do you could it's amazingly easy to stay warm when you're riding a bicycle outside in fact when i ride my bike i don't need to wear as much clothing as i do when i'm just walking i don't build up as much heat when i'm just walking and you can 
uh, get around in the winter much easier than you might imagine. There's different circumstances. Now for black ice, uh, that could get in people's head and, it, and it, uh, it could. I actually have studded bike tires. So you really could, if you have any hint of possibility of having black ice, don't ride or put studs on your, on your bike. Uh, like I said, they have studded bike tires and that just takes the guessing right out of it. And they hold like really, really well. When you're riding in this, this is just like riding in gravel. It's not so much, I mean, it's slippery, but it's just loose granular snow. Um, and even with my studded tires, if I can get down to this pavement here, I've got a better um, adhesion to the road. Otherwise, it's sort of like riding on a dirt road. It's a little slippery. So I have to go slower, but still do it. Okay. Managing space. Here we go. This is a big one. Lane position. So when we are riding in such a way that people feel like they could just yeah, squeeze past us, they're not giving us that uh, four foot of operating space, and they may not be giving us three feet of safe passing space, much less four. What we have to do is communicate that this lane is occupied. Now, this is something that some motorists uh, can't relate to. They don't ever have to think, ooh, can I take this lane by myself? They're in a car. They don't even think about it. Motorcycles will. People on motorcycles will. But uh, we need to communicate that we're occupying the lane. It's not safe to pass. And maybe I'm preparing to take a turn. So it's determined from the center line, not the curb line. So let's look at some roadways here. So you see a cyclist moving along and they're out there kind of in the middle of the lane. And rather than going in and out, in and out, they're passing a puddle, passing a pothole. They wanna be predictable. So they stay in a steady line. They wanna be relevant. So they move out and they control the lane. Want to be visible. So you can see that shadow. They moved a little farther left when they saw they were coming up to a side drive out. So that car can see them a little bit more quickly. And this is really good. So this person's going around a blind corner. It's really hard to see, but that little cyclist, you might I'll try it again. That little cyclist sticks their arm out to hold the car behind them so they don't think of passing. So this is where that double line um, is really intended when you have a blind spot. So that car is not gonna be able to get around that cyclist and be confident that uh, there's nobody coming the opposite direction. So you have to put your hand out and hold them off. And you might just like kind of put your finger up like, like just hold on a minute, hold on a minute. And again, watch what they do is they hold off that car behind them. They get around to where they're holding them, holding them. Now that cyclist will move farther to the right. They cooperate and they move right and they say, go ahead, pass. Thank you. So we cooperate with the motorists and it works a lot better. That's the cooperate part. So they moved right and they waved. And again, I can't emphasize that enough. If you are communicating with the drivers of motor vehicles to let them know you're traveling straight, someone's coming towards you and they want to turn across your line. They're nervous. They're paying attention. Maybe you see there's a lot of space. You can wave, go ahead, you go, you go. And then you go straight. They appreciate you. They give you a little toot. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to be able to communicate with people when you're out there. All right. Two lane roads, control and release. Here's some videos. We got some good feedback on the videos. Now, this is a police officer who has, is leading a ride and they're controlling the lane. They just passed a bunch of cars. He sees now there's a shoulder approaching. So rather than blocking those uh, cars that are following them, he's gonna pull over the right, let a bunch of cars pass them, and then they'll take their group of cyclists and move back out again. Or even if it's just him, so obviously someone's filming this. One more car, come on. They're a little hesitant to pass the police officer. 
Now he gets back out there. And so that's just a way of being courteous, discouraging unsafe passing in a narrow lane. So how do you do that? Well, you position yourself out there in the lane. So she's not riding on that white line. Passive discouragement with lane position. Now, you can see a double yellow line and that driver is looking, can I pass, can I pass, can I pass? They're looking, oh, there's cars coming. And then at some point, that car will see they do have an opportunity and they make a pass. Now, the rider is not encouraging them. They're not waving them on, letting them make up their own decision to pass. Now it's not safe. That person was following, she goes, oh, it's not safe. Just hold off, hold off. So active discouragement. And now what <laughs> Carrie was looking back and she was gonna actually encourage that person to pass but they were so far back, it was too, she couldn't do it at that point. And now active discouragement. So again, controlling the position, put your hand out, you're communicating, even though you're holding them off and they may not want you, who are you being on a bicycle telling them what to do? Um, you're communicating and you're connecting with them. You're not, they're not just looking at the back of your head. And that really does make a difference that you're actually connecting and then active now there's no confusion and they gave a little toot and they were fine uh we didn't have the sound on that one but that was that last little section i want to do that one again because this makes a big difference a little farther holding off and then she moves a little farther out now it's okay so there's no question for that driver they know because that cyclist is being predictable by signaling moving lane position makes a big difference. So moving over to facilitate passing is a courtesy. It's not the law. You don't have to do that. And you certainly don't have to do that um, if it's going to make you unsafe. So again, passive encouragement with lane position. So in this case, without encouragement, this driver is, is not, they're, they're very hesitant. They don't want to do the wrong thing. And what happens is they wait, they wait, they wait, then they get impatient and they wait too long and they decide the last second to make the pass and it was actually a bad decision. I mean, nothing bad happens here, but you can see that car go, oh, I'm going. And Carrie has to get out there and control the lane again because motorists sometimes make bad decisions. So that person, that little rolling up on the cyclist, that's a little bit like, oh, I'm not happy right now. It's okay. Active discouragement with lane control. It doesn't happen a lot. And again, you have a very tight, tight roadway, um, double yellow line. And the reason, you know, you might want to stay out there is because you're making a left-hand turn. So that's what she's doing. She's signaling, she's stopping there. Um, and she's actually then making a left-hand turn. So, Paul, we have about 10 minutes left, and I do have a couple comments, but I don't want to stop the presentation where it okay. is. So you can go ahead and continue, but we are a little pressed for time, and I do want to get through okay. um, two or three comments slash questions. Okay, so this is an important one I want to share with you here. So this is a study that was done, and basically what they did was they filmed the passing distance of motor vehicles passing the cyclists traveling in the roadway. And they kept moving, did it over and over and over again. And they would just keep moving the cyclists farther into the lane. So you could see each line represents a foot and you could see the color coded. So what happens is, as that cyclist started to move out farther and farther into the lane, that blue truck had to move over. And at some point they say, you know what? I got to get out into the other lane. So it was a little bit, not much of a change here. Now they hit this sweet spot when that car decides I have to get all the way into the other lane. I can't just infringe on their, that other lane a little bit. I got to get all the way over there. And that's when the cyclist was here. So when you're in that sort of left tire track area, cars can see you from a distance. They know they have to move fully. This is the same thing here. So this car is seeing, oh, that cyclist, I, I could squeeze through there. We don't want you to squeeze through there. 
Now they don't even think about it. They're not going to squeeze through anything. They're going to put their blinker on, get behind that bus and get around you here. Oh, I could just squeeze through. And that's an uncomfortable situation. And it's not that they're necessarily trying to be uh, aggressive or mean at you. They just think, oh, there's space. They don't have good spatial awareness. All right. So this is an important one I want you to see. So we have here uh, a number of views of cyclists or a cyclist traveling on this multi-lane road and they're going pretty fast. So this kind of reminds me of my Morris Avenue I ride on or Bloomfield Avenue. Well, maybe not Bloomfield, that's too busy. Not, not enough businesses. And you can't see the cyclist just yet, but you see cars moving up. And then that little camera in the upper right is how close the cars are coming up behind the cyclist. So the bicyclist is visible as a car turns right. Now you see the cyclist at a pretty far distance. So they're seeing the cyclist, they're approaching the cyclist, they see the cyclist and they change lanes to get around them. So they see him from quite a ways. And now we're gonna look at that same cyclist, basically doing that same, um, that graphic I just showed you. Now they're riding in the, what we call the right tire tracks and the cars come much closer before they realize, oh, okay, I, I need to change lanes. And they had to slow down. So cars get much too close, much, much closer, I should say. Then they have a tougher time making that decision. There's a split lane. That wasn't good. So when we are trying to be, maybe we're even trying to share the road and we are on the right side, cars don't see us and more cars get closer and they obscure us from their vision. So by the time you see the cyclist, there's a whole lot of cars right on your tail. Same thing with the motorcycles here. They were coming up behind this guy. So it's not a good way to go. And when you are in the left tire tracks, you're actually doing them a favor because they can see you and make a better decision. So if you're gonna be on the edge, that's gonna be, a, that's gonna be problematic. So there's other um, features that we want to, to cover. I'm not gonna cover that, but this is, this is where we get into some really good options here. So left-hand turns, decision one. You look, signal, change lanes, get into the left-hand only lane. And you can do that earlier. If you couldn't negotiate with all those cars, you wait till the tur light turns red and it's easier to negotiate with the cars they are slowing down to a red light. And if that fails, you can just do this. You can just do a little U-turn and now you're going straight. So this is sort of like a Copenhagen turn. Um, it's a left turn option. You could also just come across, stop at this corner. So that cyclist comes all the way across, stops at this corner, and then they wait until this traffic is moving north to south. Here's another way of looking at patterns. You might think, oh, let me go down here where there's hardly anybody. And then you get out here and there's, you can barely see it. There's a little cyclist with all these cars around them. But if you went straight and then went right on green, you have maybe 30, 45 seconds to ride all the way down this road and then change lanes to the left to make this left-hand turn. So this is actually a better way to go. So you have options. And this is something that you will see in the city of Newark. You get to know the nuances of the roadways, of the right signals, of the signal lights, the timing, um, and it makes a big difference. We're almost done winding down here. So the realities of delay, you have all these parking uh, traffic lights. That's really what's slowing people down. And this could be my commute right here on Morris Avenue. I see so many cars go buzzing past me and then I come rolling up at the next light and there they are. So people get used to that. And when it comes to planning, you can use Google Maps to really help and check your routes. You can use uh, Google Maps to look at the various bike facilities. Uh, to, whoops. So you can use that. Uh, I want to get out of there. I don't want to get out of there.
boom, sorry. And satellite view, you can use it to verify what's happening on the ground. And it's a great way to route plan and see different ways. You can look and zoom in and see what you've got, what kind of features you have. So that's some of the planning. Um, and it can be very, very helpful when you're looking at your neighborhood to find good ways to get around. So I kind of zipped through that last section a little bit, but Andrea, I want to address any questions you have or people have. Sure, thank you. So honestly, there are not very many questions, but just a lot of concerns with the bicycling or cycling in the city. So I know that we'll have in the future more bike and scooter share program kind of information sessions, but oh man, I just cleared my screen, but there was a really positive comment that was shared by someone basically just saying to the naysayer, so to speak, that, you know, if New York City can do it and it be successful, so can the city of Newark. There's going to be an adjustment, of course, and many of us may not want to make the adjustment, but it's just a part of life. So, you know, it's something that we have to accept and move forward with. So I definitely appreciate that attendee for commenting. And there was another comment Jen, can you grab it because mine cleared? The gentleman that had the question. And I have to, we do apologize. We have to scroll through to get the information. And One. he had a question, um, if our city has any plans of Newark and Jersey City working together so there could be a safe way to cycle between the two cities. Ooh. So well, that that's, was a really good question. That's that's queuing up the Essex Hudson uh railway, right? The trail. So yes. there is a uh, project that's been in the works for a long time and that is actually mm -hmm. a trail and abandoned railway from Montclair oh. to Jersey City coming down through Newark. So it touches on a lot of different communities. Um but that's, you know, that's a project. That's not going to happen next year. Um, and so I can't, I can't speak to what kind of paths get to Jersey City, but I can tell you that I totally understand why people might be uncomfortable. And I'm going to use an example of myself, who I represent kind of like that 1% of cyclists that feel like they can go ride anywhere. Well, I can tell you my wife does not. And uh, my wife is much more timid. Uh, she is also a cycling savvy instructor and a league certified instructor. Um, and she has grown a lot. And it's just, we put these strategies into, into use. You know, we practice what we preach and she gets out there, she controls the lane and she has gradually ridden more and more and more experience. And so now she has a body of experience that shows her that they work and that she communicates, she's extra courteous. She's real cute. People like, oh, yeah, let you just go. You go. And it works. So in the beginning, yes, our perception is that it's really crazy and dangerous out there. Um, but when we position ourselves properly, ride defensively, you know, make ourselves visible, be predictable, not all over the place. Don't don't cut the corners, you know, don't um, think, oh, I'm just going to, you know, do this because I can get away with it. No one's going to pull me over. Um, you know, the predictability is important and you will find that you will become more comfortable. So you just stretch your limitations a little bit. You know, you ride at a time where it's not real busy. And then you say, oh, that worked. Let me ride a little bit more, a little bit more. Same thing with weather, with circumstances, night riding. Uh, my favorite rides are at night. It's so peaceful. Nobody on the road. Now I have a question, now that you mentioned about riding at night. Have you encountered deers, raccoons, possums? <laughs> How do you deal if you're riding and they just cross over or they're trying to cross? Have you experienced that in, or how do you handle that? Well, you know, I, um, for all the riding I've done, I haven't been hit by a deer yet. But I did have a close call where I was riding. We startled each other. I was riding alongside a golf course. And there was just this little patch of maybe eight feet 
of curb to the fence, chain link fence. And there was a deer just hanging out there. It was dark. I didn't see it. I come and we're, we're quiet on bikes. I come rolling up. It's, I startle it. It startled me. And then it went running across the road and, you know, you could hear the clippity clop of their uh, hooves. And thankfully almost got hit by a road, a, a, a car coming and it had like slide and it was slipping. Cause they don't, they don't have too good attraction, but there's, um, it's not like cars, you know, they, they kind of like look at you, you know, we don't um, usually spook them as much. Uh, I've seen a lot of Fox out there. No one's bothering me. I haven't had any bad encounters with dogs, um, but it's kind of fun to see nature, to be honest with you. I, I really enjoy that. Thank you. So we are out of time and I'll just close by thanking everyone for participating. Of course, thank you for your level of expertise and your willingness to provide the presentation. What I will tell the attendees is as a newer cycler, um, I started riding in August. It helps to become more comfortable by joining a bike group or bike club or just going out with other people. So um, this stuff, as mentioned earlier, um, with the comment that I shared, you, it, it can become second nature, just like if you're a driver and you just get in your car and go, getting on your bike can become second nature and you not, you know, although you are very observant, you won't be so nervous because you have the experience. So I would just encourage you to get with other people if you are uncomfortable riding alone, but it can happen. We are moving toward having a greener, healthier, more conscious city. So I thank you for tuning in. We do have a couple more sessions. We have one more session um, of the virtual learning. It's going to be on Saturday, June 26th from 11 to 1230. So there were comments about this being an excellent training and it shouldn't just be geared towards cyclists, which I've been trying to push as well, but I think we just have the wrong name on the flyer. But yes, if you can encourage whomever to participate, we would enjoy it. We would like it. And then we have our in-person classes that will continue on this Sunday, June 13th at Bow Porter Sports Complex from 2 to 4 p.m. That's on Sunday. And then the following Saturday, June 19th, we have two sessions happening at North Community Cycling Center, which is right downtown North Two Park Place. That training is going to be from 12 to 2 and then from 3 to 5. And I see, Paul, you want to say something else. Well, no, I was just going to, you just did it. I just want to put a plug in um, and echo what you're saying is, you know, ride with some other people because there's safety in numbers. And when we do our on the bike classes, we're also building our bike handling skills because all these strategies are lovely, but if you can't control your bike and you can't reliably, you know, get your feet up on the pedals and accelerate and stop and turn all those things, those are kind of, you know, fundamental to being safe out there. You can't expect to feel safe if you can't control your bike. So you don't have to be an expert, but um, we will help you become better no matter where you're at. Everyone's starting somewhere. We will build your skills so you can feel more comfortable handling your bike and know what to do and look around and signal and all those kinds of things. And we do it in a parking lot. And then we go out and we'll take a short ride and we'll stop. We'll get off the road on the sidewalk and we'll look at the feature and say, okay, this is what we got coming up. We got a light. We got three lanes. We got to shift to the left. How are we going to do this? And everyone can try a different approach. Um, so it's not like it's one size fits all. We will help you to become um, more familiar with what your options are so you can be more comfortable riding your bike. Thank you all for facilitating this. It's a lot of fun. I wish I could see everybody, but you know, I understand it doesn't work that way. Yes, so thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. We appreciate you. Thank you, communications team, for making this happen with the smooth transition onto Facebook from Zoom. And we just look forward to seeing everyone else at either another virtual session or in person. And again, this Sunday at Beauport Sports Complex from 2 to 4, and also Newark Cycling Center on Saturday, June 19th. There's a 12 to 2 session as well as a 3 to 5. Have a great evening. Nope, it's daytime. Have a great day. Enjoy.